Well, today we're going to start the word right now, and today I'm rounding up the series that we started a couple of, about four weeks ago now, in which we talked about the fact that we are the ones who are transformed and preserved. God transformed us, and he has preserved us. God transformed us so that he can preserve us. And I'm really excited about what we're going to do as we wrap up today. So let us pray. Father Lord, I give you praise and Father, I bless your name. Father, I appreciate you and I thank you Lord for this opportunity for me and for the saints there, oh Father God, to enter into the enjoyment of your word. Minister to us, speak to us, oh Lord challenge areas of our lives that need challenging, redo, undo things that need to be undone, teach us into new ways. Yes, as we prayed earlier, bring us, O oh Father God, into the enjoyment of the spirit of wisdom and the revelation in the knowledge of your Son, Jesus Christ, so that you can gain the genuine church that you desire, all to the glory of your name. In Jesus' name we have prayed. Praise the Lord. Today, as we round up the series Transform and Preserve, I round up with a title called God's Desire for the Cold. God's Desire for the Cold. You will remember that when I first started this, so we spent two weeks looking at the Lord of the Call, which is our Lord Jesus Christ. And then Pastor David came to talk about the fact that we are being transformed and we are coming out transformed, which is the people of the call are the ones who are transformed and will, are, will come out transformed. And then we had last week the participation or the fellowship of the call by Pastor Femi Abimbola. And today I want to wrap up with God's desire for the call. When you come to find the foundation scriptures, which is found in Zechariah chapter 1, verse 3, it says, Therefore, so says the Lord, so says the Lord of hosts, return to me, says the Lord of hosts, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. Notice the fragment, the Lord of hosts, appears three times. And then in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 9, it says, God is faithful by whom you were called into fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Called into fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. God has called us to return to him, and he says we are returning into a call of his fellowship of his son. Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, saints, you do not need me to tell you that these are serious times. In fact, if you want to type it out, serious times. And in the world, they will say serious times demand, demand serious thinking or serious people. But I need you to know, in the serious times, serious times demand spiritual people, demands spiritual mind, demands a divine mind. Because in serious times, serious issues need to be dealt with. Serious issues are confronting the people. Who are these spiritual people? Who, are, who have the divine mind. According to 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 17 and 18, the Bible says that where the Spirit of the Lord is, where the, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And so if you are a saint, you're watching me, or if you want to become a saint later on today and you're watching me, you need to understand because you become a saint, you become somebody who is liberated. Praise the Lord. You are no longer under the fashioning of the world. You are no longer under the fashioning of the world. But in verse 9, verse 18, it talks about the fact that we who have the spiritual mind are transformed by the Spirit of the Lord. In Romans 12, 2, it talks about the fact that we are not to be conformed, but rather we should be transformed by the renewing of our mind. And so when you want to think about it, who are the spiritual ones that must be able to engage with the serious times? It is the person who is spirit liberated and the one who is a non-conformist. 
To be spiritually liberated means that you have been transformed by the Spirit of God and the Spirit of God has become your regulation, liberating you from fear and anxiety. And to become a non-conformist is saying, listen, you know what? I am not conforming to the fashioning of the world, but I am going to be going in another direction because of the regulation of the Spirit because my mind has been renewed. And so it is the spirit-regulated ones and the non-conformists that are going to thrive and weather and become the desire that God desires in this season and going forward. No wonder in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 6 to 16. I'm not going to read it all, but verse 6 talks about the fact that Paul says that God is speaking through the word to matured ones. These are the times for us to grow in our maturity in life. We cannot remain where we were last year. We've got to grow up. Somebody say, I am growing up. When you grow up, that is transformation. When you're growing up, that is transformed living. And then in verse 7, he says, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. These are not the days where you're going to see all laid out for you, knowing that this is the A to B, C, D. In fact, if you look at the world, that everybody is asking the leaders to know what, what will happen tomorrow. What do we need to do? What is the assurance you can give us? No man can do that because it's not in the hands of man. It is in the hands of God. And how is God going to unveil it to us? He's going to unveil it by opening us, the saints, to the mysteries that are hidden in him. Praise the Lord. No wonder we talk about that verse 9 where it's, uh, that we all enjoy. No eyes have seen, no ears have heard, neither has he entered the heart of man, the things that God has prepared for those who love him. But the Bible says these things are revealed to us through his spirit. I need you to know it is the revelation of God Christ upon our spirit that now begins to show us the things that God has got laid up for us in this season. When you come to verse 12, it will talk about the fact that we have received not from the spirit of the world, but rather the spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have freely given to us. In this season, there is something that the Lord has placed in the hand of the church to weather this season. Coronavirus, economic downturn or whatever, there is something that God has given to us. The deep things of God, which is his Christ. And hence, when you come to verses 14, he says, but the natural man does not receive it because they are spiritually discerned. I need you to know, Saints, in this time of serious times, there is a need for spiritual men and spiritual women to receive from God. For it says in verse 15, he who is spiritual judges all things, and in fact, I, I had to say, judges all things are right. Yet he himself is judged by no one, which means because you are spiritual in this season, you know all things. God is opening you up. He's leading you. He's directing you. And he's guiding you. And so true spiritual discernment starts with you and I knowing that we have been called into the enjoyment of his son. Knowing that you and I have been called into the enjoyment and the fellowship of his son. That is what 1 Corinthians 1 9 is all about. And a straightforward way of coming into this spiritual discernment that we need in this season is to come into fellowship with his word. A couple of weeks ago, I talked about the fact that we should breathe the word. I said we should breathe, B-R-E-A-T-H-E, breathe the word, which stands for believe the word, rejoice in the word, eat the word, be approved by the word, teach the word, heed the word, and entreat or pray the word. And as you do that, you'll come to an enjoyment of God breathing back to you. 
No wonder in 2 Timothy chapter 3, 2 Timothy chapter 3 is a key verse for us in this season. 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 16 says, All scripture is given by the inspiration of God. And this inspiration of God is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction and instruction in righteousness. That the man and the woman of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work, more so in this season. I want to see, I want you to, I want you to read with me from the NIV version. The NIV will say, all scripture is God breathed. NJV KB says, inspiration of God. But now it talks about God breathes. That means the word that God has given us to read in the scriptures are his breath. In 2 Corinthians 3, 16, and second, in that same verse, in that same verse, 2 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17, in the voice translation, it says, all scripture is God breath or God breathes. In its inspired voice, we hear useful teaching, rebuke, correction, instruction, and training for life. I like that. All scripture is God breath. And so what do I think, how do I sum it up? I sum it up by saying God speaking is God breathing out to us. When God speaks to us through his word, God is breathing. Somebody say, I declare and confess. Say, I declare and confess. God speaking to me in his word is God breathing into me. Say it again. God speaking to me in his word is God breathing into me. I need you to know in this season, whatever you're consuming, make sure you're consuming the word of God because God's breath is what you need to be spiritual and to be able to navigate these serious times. As we prayerfully approach the word of God, we truly breathe the word of God into us. What happens naturally? We naturally return to the Lord of hosts. Whenever you breathe the word of God, your, your doing invariably is returning to the Lord of hosts. And in our return to the Lord of hosts, guess what happens? Remember what he says in Zechariah 1.3, return to me, says the Lord of hosts, and I will return to you, says the Lord of, Lord of hosts. So in and my returning to the Lord of hosts, the Lord of hosts returns to me. And so he returns to me. He R-E-T-U-N, R-N, R-U-T-U-R-N, return to me. How does he return to me? He rescues me in every season, especially this season. He escorts me in my day-to-day -day living. Every one of you who are on the front line, I need you to know, in your going out and your coming in, the Lord is escorting you. He takes you under your, his wings to supply you. He unburdens you from fear and anxiety. He restores you to you, his joy, his peace, his life, his light, his security, and all other blessings. And of course, he negates all evil plans of the wicked one against you. And so there's a series of questions that I have that I want us to answer. Again, who is the Lord of the call? The Lord of the call is Jesus Christ. But how is he revealed in the, New, in the Old Testament? He was revealed in the Old Testament in Isaiah chapter 55, verses 3 and 4. And he calls him the sure mercies of David. And this sure message of David takes on three offices as a witness, as a leader, and as a commander. That is our enjoyment as we consider who the Lord of the call is. But how is it revealed in the New Testament? In the New Testament, when you come to Revelation chapter 1 verse 5, he says, for Christ... He says, and from Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the, over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and watched us 
from our sins in his own blood. And so Jesus in the New Testament to us is the faithful witness, still a faithful witness, witnessing to us the blessings of God, witnessing to us the fact that we are loved of God. But not only that, he is the firstborn from the dead. Remember, in every household, the firstborn is the leader of the children. We ought to be. And hence, as the firstborn from the dead, we are the many also born afterwards. And we can follow his lead by his spirit that regulates us. And not only that, he calls him the ruler of the kings of the earth. As the ruler of the kings of the earth, Christ is our commander, ruling on our behalf, but also we get to reign on this earth through. And that is why I say God has called us so that he can transform us and so that he can preserve us. Who, number two, who, is the, who are the people of the call? The people of the call are the genuine saints in the churches today. Remind, remind my, my, my words, the genuine saints in the church today. Those are the people of the core. Who are they? They are river crossers. Joshua will talk about these ones and say these ones, the Lord caused them in Joshua chapter 4, verse 23, the Lord allowed his people to cross over the river Jordan in the same way he allowed them to cross over the Red Sea. And I want you to know, Ladies and gentlemen, it's not about the fact that you're facing challenges that you now begin to question who you are. It's not because you are ill, you now begin to question your salvation or your standing with God. No, 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 no. You are a river crosser. And if you are a river crosser, God has made sure that you grow as he causes you to cross over every water, river water or water body of death in the name of Jesus. And I declare you are a, water, a river crosser. But not only that, you are the Israel of God. In Galatians 6, 16, it says, As many who walk according to this rule, what is the rule? The rule of the new creation identity. A new creation identity is the one who lives by the Spirit, by faith. Walks according to the Spirit by faith. That is the new creation identity. And whenever that you, that is your portion, what does he say? Peace and mercy be unto you as an individual and the collective saints who are the Israel of God. And so I need us to know, we have a new creation identity that we must live by. The overcoming believers is the third identity of who we are. According to 1 John 5, four to five it says whatever is born of God overcomes the world you and I because we carry the life of God dispensing Christ realized by the Holy Spirit we overcome the world I like how verse 5 puts it it says who is he who overcomes the world but he who believes in Jesus that Jesus is the son of God all we need is to believe that Jesus is the Son of God to become one who enjoys the fact that we overcome in day-to-day -day living. And the fourth one I want to add to it is the fact that we are kings and priests. In Kings and Priests, in Revelation chapter 1, verse 6, it says, And he made us kings and priests to his God and Father, to him be the glory and dominion forever and ever. I need you to know, saints, you are transformed and have been preserved because God has made you, through what Christ did by his blood, kings and priests unto him. No wonder when you come to Zechariah chapter 4, verse 14, it talks about the fact that the sons of oil, in verse 14, it says, the anointed ones who stand beside the Lord of the whole earth. These are the sons of oil. One of them is Joshua, the prophet, and the other is Zerubbabel, the governor. And Zerubbabel represents the kings. And said so the king is for building and the priest is for service towards God. I need you to know, saints, in this season, God has transformed you and preserved you so that he can gain one who can be one who builds for him out there, his kingdom come, amen, but also one who is worshipping him, serving towards him in his temple. And there must be unity, there must be congruency. You cannot be one thing out of church and another thing out there in the secular world. 
Because God has transformed you because he wants to preserve you as a king and a priest. How do we participate in this call? According to John chapter 16, verse 13 to 14, John 16, 13 to 14, he talks about the spirit of truth. When he comes, he will guide me and you into all truth. He will not speak of himself, but he will speak of Christ. And so there is a participation of the enjoyment of the Lord Jesus Christ, but through the spirit. According to Romans chapter 8, he talks about the fact that we enjoy the free spirit in verse 2. And that free spirit not only freed us from the law of sin and death, but he frees us in this situation. But we have the fulfilling spirit that has cancelled all requirements in verse 4 of chapter 8. We have the indwelling spirit of God on the inside of us for day-to-day living. We have the life-giving spirit that we enjoy in every season. Because we are not carrying death, we carry life. We have the flesh-killing spirit to kill every fear and anxiety that might want to come near us or might want to encroach upon our space. We have the leading spirit because we are children of God. We are children of Jehovah. We have the adopting spirit. The adopting spirit secures us. I need you to know, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, you are secured because of the adopting spirit. Nothing evil can come near you. You have the Abba crying spirit that's, that you can speak to every day to deliver you. And so whenever your mind is playing tricks on you, maybe you're ill somewhere, wherever you are, call upon Abba, Father, Lord Jesus, save me. And you will see the Spirit deliver you. We have the witnessing Spirit that speaks into our lives daily. Whenever the enemy wants to come, come against us, to waylay us, to accuse us, the witnessing Spirit speaks for us. The glorifying spirit to be revealed in us and the helping spirit in the time of weakness. And we have the interceding spirit that groans on our behalf. Why? Because God has chosen to transform you and I so that he can preserve you and I for his kingdom. So the question you must be asking yourself, so what does God gain out of all of this? The word of the Lord to us is that yes, we should return to the Lord and he will return to us. And we know he is the Lord. We know the Lord of the call. We know we are the people of the call. We know the spirit of the Lord is the means by which we participate in the call. So what does God gain out of this? God gains his desire in the genuine church. What is God after? God is after a new man. God is after a family. God is after a house. God is after a kingdom. God is after a body. God is after a bride and God is after a warrior. When you come to Ephesians chapter 2 verse 15, don't worry about it. I'm just going to run through it. It talks about the fact that God in Christ has created in himself, Christ, one new man out of two and making himself our peace. No more separation. When you come to Ephesians 2.19, it talks about that we, the genuine church, are members of his household, members of his family. When you come to Ephesians 2.22, it talks about the fact that we have become a dwelling place for God in the spirit. Praise the Lord. In, in, when you come to um, uh, come the kingdom, 2.19, Ephesians 2.19, it talks about the fact that we are fellow citizens with the saints, praise the Lord. Talking about the body, in Ephesians 1, chapter 22 and 3, listen to this, and if you ever have a time to go back and read it, Ephesians 1, chapters 22, uh, chapters 1, verses 22 and 3, it says, and he put all things under the feet of Christ and gave Christ to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body. And so the church is the body of Christ on earth. Not only that, talking about the bride, Ephesians 5, 31, talks about the fact that a man shall leave his mother and father and join himself to his wife and they shall become one flesh. And verse 32 says, this is a mystery because he's speaking about Christ and the church. Christ in that place is the husband and the church, the genuine church, is the bride. That is what God is after. Finally, God is looking for a warrior. He says in Ephesians 6, 
See, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the enemy. You know what? Whenever you put an armor on, it's because you're ready for war. God wants his church in this season to be ready to be a warrior. That is why he has transformed us and that is why he has preserved us so that he can gain his plan. So how does God gain his plan? God gains his plan by revealing to us in the Old Testament that the way he got his plan was through the laws and the prophets. But it has changed now. In the New Testament, it is simply by us believing in Christ. Listen to what Galatians chapter 3, verse 22 and 3 says. It says, but the scripture has confined all under sin, that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. And that means in the New Testament, the promise to those who are confined under the sin is true faith in Jesus Christ. But listen to what it says. But before, he said, but before faith came, that means before the New Testament, it, they were kept under God by the law. Listen, this law was never written to you. It was written to those in the Old Testament. However, the law is valid, it is righteous and it's holy. And hence, our fulfilling the law is not in ourselves, it is in our faith in Christ Jesus. And so believing in Christ Jesus means that we have fulfilled that which is required of the law. No wonder in Romans 3 verses 20 to 21 says, Therefore, by no deeds of the law, of the Lord, he said, but therefore, by the deeds of the Lord, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For the law is the knowledge of sin. But the righteousness of God apart from the law, the righteousness of God without the law having anything to do with it, being witnessed by the law, capital L, personified, and the prophets. He says, even the righteousness of God through faith in Christ Jesus to all and on all who believe. Brothers and sisters, God has transformed you and preserved you because he wants you not to come to the law. Whenever you come to the law, you come to the curse. But when you come to Christ, you come to the blessings of Abraham. And that blessings of Abraham preserves you in this season so that God can gain that what he desires. Now wonder, we've been reading through Zechariah, especially at the cell group level. And in Zechariah chapter 5, we come to two visions. The first vision is a vision of the flying scroll. And that's found in verses 1 to 4. And the second vision is a vision of the woman in a basket or the woman in a ephah. Verses 5 to 11. What does this depict? Because it's important that we allow the word of God to become an open book to us. In the open book of the word concerning this is that in this season... God is judging upon the earth and he is expiring or expelling from his genuine church anything that will not allow him to achieve what he desires. And so he says that concerning the flying scroll, looking at the dimension, he says 20 by 10. 20 by 20 means that it's a book. It's like me opening a book, equal size. And on this side, he says, listen, I am I'm sending out a curse to those who are ungodly or those who are unrighteous, those who are doing negative things or stealing or thieving against others. And on this side of the book, I am sending out a curse unto those who are swearing or perjuring, uh, perjuring as it were, uh, this is the right word, God. What means they are not living godly. And so Bible is saying that in this season, God wants a genuine church that is living godly lives. Not living unrighteously or ungodly, but godly lives. In the first half of the book, it talks about the fact that those who are thieving or stealing are sinning against other people. 
That, and we know what the commandment says. You shouldn't murder, you shouldn't commit adultery, you shouldn't steal, you shouldn't be a false witness, or neither should you covet. And hence, really, it's not for us to begin to now say, oh, I mustn't do this, I mustn't. But the spirit regulating on the inside of you will never allow you to find yourself in any of these things. And if you're finding yourself in these things, then there's grace. Praise the Lord. Because the grace of God receives you the way you are, but he will never keep you or leave you the same way you are. The same thing with about for swearing falsely. Whenever you swear falsely, what you're saying is that you are denying God, his whole Godship over yourself. And God is saying, this is a time in the church that I must expel all forms of ungodliness. And somebody say, there is grace. How does grace deal with this? In, chapter, in, in Titus chapter 2, verses 11 to 12, it says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us to deny ungodliness. Ungodliness is the issue with why the law was given. And hence, in order to deal with the issue of ungodliness, God has instituted grace. The grace will come and he will teach you how to deny ungodliness. That is why you need the word. That is why you need to come into participation of the Holy Spirit. Because as we heard last week, the, the, you know, that our enjoyment of, of the relationship with God can be intervened and can be inhibited because of a life that is ungodly. And but there is grace. Praise the Lord. And then let's talk about the woman of the, in the Ephah. And this is very important. And began, as the more I began to read it, the more I began to realize that one of the things that we're making this age far about now, and you might bear with this to this, one of the things that the whole world has made this whole issue of coronavirus about is, yes, about the lives that have been lost, and God knows we, are, we, 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 we commiserate and our prayers goes out to those who have lost. But the world is fast making it now about money. They're making about economy. And really one of the reasons why we're going back and we're um, looking at things and planning things ahead is about, okay, how is the next way of making money going to be? And it's important that we, the saints, do not be caught up in all of this. Because the Bible says in verses 5 to 11 of Zechariah chapter 5, it says the vision of this basket, and he calls it wickedness. The basket, when you look at the right word for basket, it comes from the word ephah. Ephah is a word that you, denotes how they measured grain, how they measured items, an ephah of wheat, an ephah of barley that was given out. And that talks about commerce. And God is saying, you know what? This is a time when I am taking out the effect that the commerce and the love of money, the love of affluence, the deceitfulness of riches has had in the church. I am taking it out and I am taking it back to the world so that my church can be built by the genuine ones. Am I saying that we shouldn't work? No, we should work. But we must be sober in how we go about our business. So many of us up to now, until now, we never gave God a second thought. Yes, we came to church, but we never really took God, took God seriously. But now, let it be that now that we've taken God seriously, that even after the lockdown, we still take God seriously. Even God will regulate you into how he wants you and where he wants you to make your living going forward. And that is the worldly loss that we see that God says, I am taking it out out of the land of Israel and I'm taking it back to Babylon where it belongs. And so because God has transformed you and preserved you for a reason. So what is the remedy? The remedy is in the word of God. Galatians 3 13 and 14 again. It says, Christ has redeemed you and I from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, curse is everyone who hangs on the tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon we who are the Gentiles in Christ, that we might receive the Spirit through faith. The promise of the Spirit can only be received through faith. It is not in your ability to make it happen out there. It's not in your ability to scheme out there. It is through the Spirit, through faith. And I pray that each and every one of us, we come into the angel. That is what grace is there for. The teaching, the regulating of the Holy Spirit that you are about to enjoy in this season will minister to you so that you become godly. You no longer live unrighteously. You become godly and you become righteous towards your fellow people. 
But also when you come to Ephesians chapter 3, and I just want to focus on the last bit, verse 8. It talks about, to me, who I am, am less than the, the least of all the saints, this grace was given to me that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. It's high time that the genuine church focus on not worldly riches, but the unsearchable riches of Christ. Brothers and sisters, I can assure you, as you get into the enjoyment of the word, God himself will bring you into his unsearchable riches that will elevate you, that will transform you. These are serious times, and it requires spiritual people. And God has something that is unsearchable, that's hidden, and nobody knows for you, but only if you will turn your heart to this Christ who has unsearchable riches. So what should be our response as I close? Our response should be twofold. Embrace the promise of the Spirit through faith for regulation. Every ungodliness can be dealt with through you embracing the Spirit of grace that will regulate you. And it, that Spirit of grace will teach you to be godly towards God to actually serve God and worship God in spirit and in truth and to be righteous towards men not based on your doing but because on but based on the regulation of the spirit that refuses you from doing something that you even you now know that is not right like lying like arguing like quarreling like scheming the second thing and how do we do that i want to encourage you breathe the word of god believe the word Rejoice in the word. Eat the word. Let the word of God approve you. Teach the word. Heed the word and pray the word. Number two, embrace the unsearchable riches of Christ, which is able to deal with worldly loss. I know sometimes it's hard for us as individuals to see people next door doing things and you're thinking they're living a life and you not to be caught up in wanting to go in that direction. But embrace the unsearchable riches of Christ. And that unsearchable riches of Christ will teach you not to live worldly, but to live soberly. And in your sober living, guess what happens? You have returned to God. And the Lord has returned to you to rescue you, to escort you, to take you under his arm to unburden you, to restore to you his joy, his peace, his life, his light, his security, and all other blessings. And also he will negate all evil. And so before we pray, I want to leave this scripture with you because I want you to pray this. In Isaiah 49, and I want you to make this a prayer point right now and even afterwards. Because this is the reason why God has transformed you and preserved you. Why God, the Lord of the call, has called you so that you can participate in him, so that he can gain his desire. Isaiah 49, verses 2 and 3. And he made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand he has hidden me and made me a polished shaft in his quivers he has hidden me and he said to me you are my servant O new wine you are my servant O man of God and woman of God in whom I will be glorified God is saying, in your mouth, he has made it like a sharp sword. A sharp sword spe only speaks the word of God, speaks the mind of God. Remember, in these serious times, we're not looking for serious people. In these serious times, we're looking for spiritual people who will speak the word of God, the counsel of God, into the household, into their families, into that workplace, into the society, into the earshot of those who are leading. And that's what it means 
You will not speak the word of the... You will not be conformed by the world, but you'll be transformed by the Spirit of God. But not only that, he said he has made you a polished shaft. A polished shaft means a polished arrow, an arrow that is smoothed out. All the edges have been taken out. All the roughness, all the bench parts have been taken out. You know what that means? That is what grace does. Grace will teach you to live godly, righteously, and soberly. And then, once the polished shaft is ready, it is ready to be committed to where God wants it. I remember that Psalm 127. He talks about like, like arrows in the hand of a warrior are one's children. Once the arrow is let loose and God wants to let you loose into the world so that you can be committed to hit the target, do what he desires, and so that he can gain glory. And my declaration is that as you have come into this season of being transformed and preserved, as you have come into this season of being one who enjoys the fellowship with God, you enter into the enjoyment of being a sharp sword and a polished arrow because that is what God desires for you and that is what he has transformed you for and that is what he's preserving you for. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.